In mid-2014, a nature photographer by the name of David Slater licensed these images to the Cater News Agency. Unfortunately, uh, for him anyway, uh, it was revealed that he did not in fact take the photograph himself. What had actually happened was that this handsome ape behind us, a crested black macaque, I can't recall her name, had seized the remote camera trigger and taken a photo of herself twice. These are in fact monkey selfies. <laughs> so on those grounds, these photographs were uploaded to Wikimedia Commons. David Slater was very upset. He sued Wikimedia Commons. Uh, it, it started a spate of countersuits between Wikimedia Commons, PETA, um, any number of other organizations, and it's currently working its way through the courts right now. So what's interesting about this, I think, is that it, uh, the reason why uh, the photograph was uploaded to Wikimedia Commons was because the monkey took the photograph, meaning that David Slater himself was not, this is not his intellectual property. The labor that created the photograph was conducted by the monkey, not by the photographer. And this has some really interesting uh, sort of uh, legal ramifications, right? So what kind of thing is an animal that it can hold intellectual property? What kind of animal can possess intellectual property? And I think these sorts of questions really abraid nicely against uh, sort of the way we think about not only our relationships with animals, but also what it means to be a human, what, 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 what entitles one to personhood, and uh, both in a social but also in a legal sense. So with that in mind. Um, so this kind of question, right, whether or not something like a monkey, this crested black macaque, can hold, uh, whether or not it can ha hold intellectual property, it probably seems very progressive. It seems maybe enlightened. It seems, you know, something comes out of our own, uh, our, our, an age in which we're interested in things like vegetarianism, and we're disavowing ourselves of things like industrial farming, and we don't like fur anymore, and all these kinds of things. But my argument is that instead of being a matter of uh, this sort of enlightened progressive thing, it's more a, a reinvigoration of a kind of latent medievalism. It's a disavowal of an enlightened idea of animals as machines, and it returns to a medieval idea that animals have minds and motives and are capable of moral judgments in very much the same way we are. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about and unpack today. Um, so, the idea of the legal rights of animals has actually quite a long and interesting history in the Western legal tradition. I mean Western in the broader sense of being Europe, uh, the Near East, and Northern Africa. I don't have time, unfortunately, to create some kind of universal thesis as to why this is the case. But I am interested in this in a, in a very precise moment in time. And precise, by precise, I still mean two centuries, but precise enough. Between the 15th and the 17th centuries. This is at the, 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 the height of the Renaissance. Now, at this point, at the height of the Renaissance, there is this weird spike in animal trials, these criminal trials of animals, where animals are treated as if they're legal persons and they're tried as such. Given what we know about the Renaissance, that seems kind of weird, and I'll, I'll go through that right now. So this here is a, uh, is, is a, I suppose it's a, a detail from The Ambassadors by Holbein the Younger, and it shows two very handsome, befurred men lounging, luxurating, if you like, in front of uh, a bunch of scientific instruments. So, I mean, these two men are a Renaissance science par excellence. When we think about the Renaissance, we are talking about, uh, you know, no doubt you remember this from school, the Renaissance is, is a period where there's these sort of massive revolutions in science and philosophy and politics in a whole bunch of other things. So what happens in this period and what inspires paintings like this is an event called the Scientific Revolution. And the Scientific Revolution uh, is this sort of first attempt to try and do science without the meddling of Aristotle. It's the first time that scientists can function uh, and, and they look at just got raw data and try to extract uh, findings based upon that data. So that alone is weird. Uh, and it, it seems like, though, that, that instead there's this view that the animals, uh, they're not people, right? There's no sort of, there's no, they're not humans. Uh, for, these, for these medieval jurists, there's no sort of ontological confusion about whether or not these 
this pig as a person. I mean, they're not, they don't think it's a human being. But nonetheless, in some sense, it's a legal person. Not a human, but a legal person. It's really, really weird. So this is, this is obviously is a time before such things like rights exist. Like we talk now about human rights or about legal rights in this kind of you know, free, easy way. But the idea that we, what we think of now as rights, they're, I mean, they're kind of a recent legal philosophical invention, right? So I don't, I don't want to go on and say that these, these animals had human rights, because that's clearly crazy. But what I'm, what I'm arguing is that animals in this period were entitled to certain um, uh, juridical protections, I guess, under the law, that you would absolutely not expect. OK, so you're with me? I'll give you a couple of examples. This is, and these are good. These are really funny. I promise. Um, so in uh, 1750, a Frenchman by the name of Jacques Ferrand was arrested for buggering a donkey. He had been captured, he'd been, sort of, he'd been, he'd been, he'd been caught by the villagers in Delicto Flagrante, as they say, uh, and the, both the donkey and Jacques Ferrand had been arrested. Both arrested. Because <laughs> they were both arrested on the crisis of charge of sodomy, right, of sort of unnatural sex acts. And this is both violates the, both the, the laws of both God and country. Both the donkey and the man were arrested, and, and, and Jacques Ferrand had his trial first, and it was a summary trial. He was found clearly guilty, and he was hanged by the neck until he was dead. Bugger. The donkey, though, was a good donkey. And so what happened was the local prior, so the local, the, the, the local pastor, uh, on behalf of his constituency, wrote a letter to the magistrate saying, she is a good donkey. She is a kind donkey. She would never commit to this of her own free will. She is the victim of violence. And the magistrate straight went, that's totally reasonable. <laughs> the donkey's moral character was legally relevant when working out her level of culpability. And the donkey was let go. And I don't know her name, but I assume she lived a long and happy life. There is another case that I really like, a little bit earlier, so early 1500s. There's this guy uh, called Bartolome Chassenet. I'm probably mispronouncing that, I apologize. Uh, a French jurist, another Frenchman. I don't know what it is. And he worked in both ecclesiastical and civil courts dealing with trials of animals. And one of his first trials was with a group of rats. He was the court-appointed defense attorney for a group of rats, a horde of rats, who had consumed the entire contents of a barley field, just devoured it, right? And so because, there were, because the, the rats were, had been charged with this crime, they were summoned to court. And of course they didn't show up because they're rats. <laughs> and so the magistrate says to Chastanet, mate, come on, where is your client? What's he doing? And Chastanet says, totally reasonably, rats have no fixed place of abode. They didn't know. They didn't get the letter. <laughs> and the magistrate says, Totally fair. They don't. So it gets delayed. And there's the second summons, and the rats again fail to show up. This is a pattern, incidentally. Uh, and the magistrate says, what's going on? Where are my rats? And Chastanet says, oh, well, you know, we need to make accommodations for the old and the infirm. They need to show up as, as a unit. You know, we need to delay it once more time. And the magistrate begrudgingly does so. And this happens a couple more times. On the fourth or fifth iteration, so I imagine the magistrate's very, very annoyed by this point, uh, he says, look, what, like, you know, we, we need to do something about this. You need to bring them to court. And Chassanet invokes a piece of legal reasoning we still use now. He says, the rats live in mortal fear of their enemies, the cats, and cannot be expected to show up to court. This is a legal principle that a lot of jurisdictions still use now. If you have been summoned to court and you, can, and you fear for your life, you feel like your life would be in danger in doing so, it is the obligation of the court to provide you protection. That's necessary. That's a, that's a legal right you have. Chassanet invoked that legal right back in the 1500s for these rats. And the magistrate straits went, that's totally fair. So the magistrate then had two choices. Do I throw the case out and let the rats go? Or do I tax the local constituency to round up potentially thousands of rats to bring them to court? 
obviously he let the case go, because he's not crazy. <laughs> because he didn't want to be lynched by a bunch of angry French villagers. I mean, this is, uh, this is, <laughs> this, this case uh, is, is really interesting, because it, 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 uh, this and the previous one, because they both seem to apply that animals under this, uh, in a sort of legal structure, uh, were entitled, at least in some cases, to equal rights under criminal law as human beings. It's great. And, I mean, look, I, I'm not going to deny, like, being an animal in the medieval period was sometimes super shit. I mean, it, it sucked. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. But it's, it's, it's interesting in that, in that human beings were treated equally brutally under the criminal law. You could be hanged, you could be put in stocks, you could be publicly embarrassed. You, like, your punishment's at the discretion of the local magistrate in a lot of cases. I mean, if animals were treated cruelly under the criminal law, anyway, it was only because everyone was treated cruelly. Which I think is pretty cool. That's pretty interesting. So, what do we do? Like, we have this problem. We have this thing where there's supposedly there's this renaissance rise towards sort of this materialism, towards, you know, sort of disavowing the... Uh, the sort of spiritual or the mental content of, of things in the world, only humans have it. So there's this sort of materialistic you know, upswing through the Renaissance, and at the same time, stuff like this happens. 140 recorded cases, and there's probably more, 140 recorded cases of animal trials in the Renaissance. So how do we, how do we sort of work through this? So my argument is that uh, this is sort of evidence of the fact that the Renaissance, we talk about it as this blanket movement, but in fact it's this uneven sort of give and take, so it starts in Italy, right, and sort of it creeps out, and it's sort of, it's sort of this battles along the way, and it's this incomplete kind of uh, spreading. And what we can see here is a point when something that looks like the rule of law intersects with this medieval view of animal life. But the rule of law thing is also kind of complicated, right? So, all these, although these animals were entitled to certain rights under criminal law, uh, say if you are a Jew or a Muslim, you were not entitled to those rights. Animals had the rights that Jews and Muslims did not. I mean, although that sounds, you know, sort of deep, <laughs> it sounds, it is deeply problematic, I mean, I, I think what this really does is highlight the conditions under which personhood, like as an idea, as a legal quality, is awarded to people in the medieval period. And so my claim is that something like personhood is, this, is, is something that belongs to sort of members of given faith communities, right? You're, you're, you know, if, you, if you live in a village and you participate in the religious life and you, know, you're sort of, you sort of participate in that little ecosystem, you are in some sort of limited, pre-theoretical sense, considered a person. But if you don't participate, you're not. So you go to church, or you're, you're, you're part of the community, if you don't, you're not. But, so with all that seems fine, but the, 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 the cascading implication of that is that for uh, Ferron's donkey, or for Chastanet's rats, both of these entities are considered to be Christians under the law, which is super weird. So obviously, in the end, um, the, 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 the Renaissance won. Right, so for, for a very, very long time, uh, I mean, it's, there's a reason why animal trials almost completely die out after the 17th century. There are still some uh, sort of uh, atavistic cases. They, they all basically, the, these trials basically stop happening, right? And so that seems to apply to me anyway, that this, that this sort of rule of law idea, it sort of spreads through, it spreads through the community first, and then you have this subsequent belief, which is that of the, uh, this sort of idea of animals as being these mechanical constructs, right? That, I think, is sort of, it's sort of this interesting takeaway from the Renaissance, right? And how we, we, we talk about uh, sort of like personhood as being this, this it, it suddenly becomes flexible, it becomes mutable, it's no longer this abstract, inalienable, rock-hard thing, but it becomes subject to the intuitions that we hold about what it means to be a person, both legally or morally or whatever. Which brings us to where we're going now. Happy little dolphin. So it seems to me that because of the, the way these, these uh, trials, the, the number of which diminishes, but suddenly we have now, I think, in the early 20th century, we have this, there's a, somehow a resurgence. There's this, sort of, there's this new uh, growth of, of, of people talking about animals as if they're persons. 
And this, I think, is a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of reasons for this. One of which is because, and in the Western world, we tend to award person, in the contemporary Western world, we tend to award personhood on the basis of intelligence. So we, don't, we no longer award it on the basis of, on the basis of religious community. So what happens is all these, sort of, all these sort of studies come out about animal cognition and people start thinking seriously about what kinds of, uh, what kinds of uh, conditions one needs to meet in order to become a person, right? And so you have these, these there's been a number of interesting cases. So in Switzerland in 1992, um, animals were deemed as beings and not things under the law. Uh, New Zealand... Um, gave basic legal rights to great apes in 1998, I think. In 2002, Germany extended those same, uh, those same considerations to all animals. Um, in the early 2000s, the Balneric Islands, I'm probably mispronouncing that, there is an autonomous province of Spain, gave full legal rights to all great apes. And in 2015, which I think is the most amazing one, uh, for a very, very brief period, I mean, it was, related, it was later redacted. It was later sort of take, taken out of the legal record. For a very brief period, two lab chimpanzees at the State University of New York were awarded the right to habeas corpus. They were awarded the right to not be contained without having committed a crime, which meant they had the right not to be in cages. That's pretty amazing. That right was... When, I think when the judge realized what he'd done... <laughs> there, was, there was a quick backpedaling. But it's this really fascinating thing where, we, we, like, right now, us in the, in the early 20th century, you know, we've for so long taken these enlightened ideas of what it means to be a person kind of for granted, and then, and then suddenly we're confronted with, you know, something like this, this sort of intelligent, thinking, feeling creature, and we, might, we think to ourselves, maybe we have to extend the borders of what it means to be a person a little bit. Maybe that's just what we need to do. And so, in keeping with the theme of the day, this is the rise and fall, right? This is these kind of intuitions. These are kind of a litmus test for for how we measure our own sense of what it means to be a person. And I think that's really interesting. So that's my takeaway message for you today. Anyway, that's all. Thank you.